Good morning and welcome to Harrisville Baptist Church. <laughs> We're so glad. Kim, three seconds before I did that, Kim went, good morning. It's like I do it every Sunday or something. Anyway, so what am I going to do next? Everybody stand, go shake a hand, come back, finish, help us singing this song. I'm satisfied with just the cottage below A little silver and a little gold But in that city where the ransoms will shine I want a gold one that silver line I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where you'll never grow old and someday yonder we will never more wander but walk on streets that are pure as gold I guess Don't think me poor or deserted or lonely. I'm not discouraged because I'm heaven bound. I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a harp and a crown. I've got a mansion. Just over the hilltop In that bright land Where he's right here Will never grow old And someday yonder We will never more wander But walk on streets That are pure as gold Hey, Amen, give God a hand all righty, y'all may be seated. All right. Morning, let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we just come to you, come to you in your house. We just praise your name, thanking you for all that you've already done for us this morning already, waking us up and allowing us to come to your house to worship. We pray that uh, as we go throughout the rest of this day that we can live in accordance to your will and everything that we think, say, and do be glorifying and honoring to you. I pray that you would um, just give Steel and Brother Rich the words to, to sing and to preach to us today and the musicians that they would uh, be able to play to the best of their ability um, to um, just glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wonderful, so wonderful is your unfailing love. The cross has spoken mercy over me. I have seen no ear as heard, no heart can fully know. Glorious, how beautiful you are. Beautiful. Oh, my soul, my sin. 
fills the skies. Your mighty works display for all to see. The beauty of your majesty awakes my heart to sing. How marvelous, how wonderful you are. Beautiful one, I love. Beautiful one, I adore. Beautiful one, my soul must see. You opened my eyes to your wonders anew. You captured my heart with this alone. There's nothing on earth. some of us, a newer song for some of us, but I pray that it is our prayer that he's the one we focus on. You know, we can focus on a whole bunch of different other stuff, especially even coming to church, we can focus on our brains can be everywhere else, but I pray this morning that um, as we sing these songs, our brains and our hearts and our minds will be focused on the one we're supposed to be focused on. Amen? So if y'all would, please stand for this one. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from
doesn't mean, and I don't know y'all know this, y'all may be seated. That doesn't mean that we have to, we worship a physical cross. But what that means is the cross is supposed to represent what happened on the cross and who happened on the cross and what he did on the cross for us. And so this last song, there's a lot of stuff that can go on, a lot of stuff we'll talk about this morning that happened in Saul's life where he did not ask God for anything. He kind of did the worship stuff afterwards because that's what he was supposed to do. And so he's like, well, God, why didn't you bless it? I did what you told me to do. But it's all about when, when God says that David had a heart after God, after God's own heart, that means David sook, sought, sought, that's the word. David sought after what God wanted for him in his life. And so sometimes we can, we can get up and we can do the Sunday morning thing and we can get dressed and we can come sit in a padded pew and we can um, look at this fat, hairy guy trying to sing, and we can do what we can go through all the motions. But if the heart's not behind it, wasn't it that um, you know Samuel said that uh, he would rather, you know, he he wants the praise of his people and the love of his people, and above the service of the people. And so it's not that we do the service to get the recognition, to get the, hey, God, bless me because I did this, but it's the opposite. And so this song is, Here I Am to Worship. And so it's almost like, we can come do all the stuff, but if our hearts aren't in the right place, then we're just doing them because we're, we grew up in the Bible Belt, and this is what we do on Sunday mornings. And so my prayer this morning is to be that we will, the main thing will be him, and he becomes why we do whatever we do. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with getting up and coming to church, coming to Sunday school, coming to Wednesday nights, coming to Sunday nights. There's nothing, we're, you know, God wants us to do that, but he doesn't want us to do it because it's a checkbox thing and then we leave and our hearts are still the same when we left as it was when we got here. God wants to move in our hearts. God wants to move in our lives. God wants to be number one. And so this song is, Here I Am to Worship.
Lord, I pray that is our prayer. Lord, that um, here we are to worship, here we are to bow down, here we are to say that you're our God. God, I know it's one thing to say it, I know it's one thing to sing it, but it's a completely different thing to live it and believe it. And I pray that is our, our heart's desire, is to know you and to make you known. God, I thank you so much for this church. I thank you for the hearts in this church. I thank you for the kids in this church, God. I thank you for the adults in this church. God, I pray, Lord, that right now, all of our hearts and minds will be focused on you and what you have to say through Brother Rich this morning. God, be with him. Hide him behind the cross. Give him the words to give to us. And you be praised through every bit of it. In your awesome name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to uh, the end of the first week of May, which doesn't seem right, uh, but it is. And here we are, which means summer is coming up. Boy, it has, uh, it has been a busy, busy couple of weeks here in our church family. A lot of uh, great things going on, but also some tough things going on for some individual families as well as our church family as a whole. But I just want to tell you how thankful I am as your pastor in the way you've responded in many of these. And I want to read a card from one of those families uh, to, uh, to express their gratitude towards you. In the front of the card, you know, sometimes we get into the part that the people wrote, but sometimes the cards have something great to say in addition to that. The front of the card says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Of course, that's Psalm 107. 1. It says, A special thanks to you. And then it's written, There are no words to express our gratitude. Thank you all for the kind words, prayers, hospitality, and meals. Our church family is truly like no other with love from the Bridges family. We continue to lift up the Bridges family as well as the Deer family uh, and the loss of, of those two sweet and cherished loved ones, but we know that they're getting to have a better worship service this morning than even we're going to get to have. And uh, still, guys, y'all do an awesome job. Congregation, you're wonderful, but it's not close to compare what they're going to do this morning. And uh, if there is Sunday worship, if it's any different than everyday worship in the presence of the Lord, then they're getting to do it. And uh, just thankful for a church family that does love one another. Uh, we're all people, <laughs> so we don't always agree. We don't always think the same things. We don't always approach things the same way. Uh, but when it comes down to it, I really believe that we love one another, and we do the best we can in each moment that God gives us to, uh, to serve, to minister to one another. And I want to encourage you to keep doing that, church family. Um, so thankful for the ministry that is going on. We come this morning to the end of a long series. In fact, I think the longest series that I've done since I've been pastor here, uh, 15 weeks of, for the first half of 1 Samuel. And if you, don't, if you think, you know, if you're into setting records or pushing it one step further, Lord willing, in the fall, we'll do 16 weeks of the second half. Are you excited? I'm excited. We'll find out the rest of the story. Uh, but we come to the end of the first half of the book of 1 Samuel. And we see in 1 Samuel what we've seen all along these last many months, these last several weeks. Uh, we see that first off, the nation of Israel is as at that point the nation of Israel had always been. They follow the Lord. The Lord is their God. The Lord is their king. He tells his man and sometimes even his woman in the time of the judges what to do, how to do it, how to fight, when to fight, when to worship, how to worship, and so on and so forth. He tells them and they turn around and hopefully most of the time in obedience Tell it to the people, and that's where, well, people are people. Sometimes the people would do exactly as the Lord told them through His people, and sometimes they would do their own thing. And certainly, as we've read through this, this sermon series and worked through this sermon series called Seeking a King, they began to have in their heart a desire to be different from the way God made them and more like everybody else. And so they came about something they, they kind of, found a clause in God's promises and God's law and said, we want to do that and we want to do that now. God had provided that they would one day in his timing in the future have a king, but they stopped and said, we want to do it right now. Give us a king. And God obliged. God didn't change his will, but he allowed his permissive will to happen in their lives and he gave them a king and he sought out a king and he anointed a king and he set apart a king for them and sure enough this king is a man named Saul. Saul has done a lot of stuff. Just as Steele was mentioning a moment ago during our music time, Saul did a lot of things for Saul. 
He started off very humbly, very unsure that he would even be able to be thought of as the king, much less be made the king of the people of Israel. And then it started to go to his head. He started to do the very things that other earthly kings all did at different times and in different ways. He started to do those things. He started to honor himself. He started to take on roles that weren't his. He started to let the power and the glory of it all, instead of be uh, something that would get, was given to him that he redirected towards the Lord, he started to take it in for himself. And the reason we stop after, verse, or after chapter 15 this morning in our break between the two halves is because this is the point, chapter 15, is where God says through Samuel, enough. God has been gracious. God has been patient. God has been merciful to Saul, giving him abundant opportunity at every turn to, to submit and humble his heart before the Lord, to turn away from doing things for Saul and begin to do things for God just as God had intended. And indeed, had he done that, well, the rest of the story would have read differently. But he didn't. God is infinitely patient with us until he's not. God was infinitely patient with Saul until he's not. You say, well, that's not how it infinitely works. Yes, it is. Because you've got to hear what we're saying. Infinitely patient doesn't mean that there is no end to the patience of God. It means that while he is patient with us, there is no one more patient with us. Does that make sense? But there will come a time, and God's promised this. This is not a bait and switch. This is not a, aha, I got you. This is not in the fine print. God has promised us that there will be a time where he will send his son to return to gather up those who have put their faith in him, who have passed on first, and then the rest of us who might still be alive at that time. There will be a time where that infinite patience will come to an end and ultimate judgment will step in. Well, the ultimate judgment isn't going on in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, but certainly a, a great deal of judgment and a big action from God is done in the life of Saul and the people of Israel. In the first uh, 10 verses or so, first 9 verses uh, of, of 1 Samuel chapter 15, a lot of things happen. First off, God says through Samuel to Saul, he says, Saul, I want you to go and I want you to absolutely, utterly destroy these, this, this wicked people who have been attacking the people of Israel, who have been raiding them over the time. Not the Philistines, but the Amalekites this time. Remember we read previous chapters that there was not just the Philistines that Saul fought against, but all kinds of other nations that were constantly in conflict. And this is left over from the command that was given to the people of Israel even in the time of Joshua many, many years before Saul's time, to wipe out those that were in the promised land. And I know this, this morning in 2023, that doesn't sound like a, a God of love. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, I have, hard time, uh, I have a hard time understanding it myself. Why would God say wipe out whole nations? If he said that today, the whole world would say, well, that's, uh, that's proof that there is no God. That God doesn't love you. He's made up. You only say he loves you when it helps you and when it, when it works for you. I don't understand fully and completely how he would command them to do that. But I'm also not a holy God. I'm also not a person who can stand here before you and at 46 and some months years old tell you that I can know a time when there wasn't sin in my life. There has always been sin in my life for as long as I can remember and there's still sin in my life. I still fight desires and fight habits and fight even new sin it being introduced in my life just like you do. If you're sitting out there and going, no, that must be y'all, it's not me. You're lying to yourself and you've been fooled. We're all fighting that. Which is why we can't understand the will of God when He says things like utterly remove these people from the land. Utterly destroy them. But that's what He tells Saul to do. He says to put all of the Amalekites to the sword and he goes into detail with them. He says all the livestock. And he even mentions different types of livestock. Oxen uh, you know, and goats, all, all kinds of different things. He says, he gives the instructions to Saul to wipe them out. So Saul gathers his army. There's a bunch of them. There's more than the last time we saw Saul's army. There's more than those 600 that were left over after everybody had scattered out that God brought miraculous victory to uh, over the Philistines that day. 
There's thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of them. They come together and they attack the Amalekites as God said to, but they don't finish. They don't do what God says specifically. They don't complete what God has commanded them to do. They do, as Saul has continued to do up to this point, what seems right to them. And what they end up doing is, is they, take, they, they put to the sword all the people, but they spare the king, Agag. They spare him for whatever purposes. And they spare the best of all the livestock. Now, if you know anything about conquering armies, when they spare the best of things, why do they do it? For themselves. For plunder. For the spoils of war, right? That they might have the best of the people that they conquered, their possessions, their property, their livestock, their buildings, their whatever. Whatever was not destroyed in the war. Saul and his army do exactly that. Those first nine verses tell us this story. God has said, do this. They've done something different. He said exactly what to do, and they've gone a different direction. And so in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, verse 10, we pick up and read this. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry, and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone, down, gone on down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. We see here in these first four verses that we read this morning, after his great disobedience, after his great doing his own thing, when God was very clear in what God had for him to do, we see that the the, the disobedience of Saul has an effect. And in fact, this morning, our disobedience breaks God's heart. It breaks God's heart. We can read about Saul and think about a king of old. We can think about a character in a story that has a moral for us to learn. And we can think of it in a detached nature from ourselves. And that's often the way we read the Bible, isn't it? That's often the way we look at it and go, oh yeah, well that's kind of an extreme case. Oh well that's kind of, you know, when it's somebody being faithful, we think, well we can never be that faithful. Oh we can never, God would never work in me that way because I'm just not there. I'm just not good enough. I'm not, uh, that's just not me. Never been that guy. I've never been that girl. I'm never going to be that guy or that girl. But we do the same thing when it's the disobedient people. We say, oh. Yeah, they shouldn't have done that, but we overlook all the disobedience in our own life. We overlook the things that God very clearly has shown for us to do, that we go and do a little bit different or a lot different than what He said. Our disobedience breaks God's heart. What does He say here? In verse 10, Saul, or excuse me, Samuel hears the word from the Lord. God says to him, He says, here's what I'm going to tell you. In verse 11, he goes on and he says, I regret that I have made Saul king. Why? Because he's turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. I regret that I have made Saul king. Now, wait a minute. When I think about things that I regret that I've done, a lot of times, one of the biggest parts of my regret is that I did something not knowing how it would go. Is that how you regret? Uh, I make a choice. I have a relationship. I, I have an attitude. I say words. I do things. Because I think at the time it's the right way to go, and then I get slapped upside the head by unintended consequences. Things that I hadn't even thought about might could happen. And I have regret. Sometimes we know some of what could happen, when we make these decisions, when we make these choices, but we don't know all of it, and that brings regret. Every once in a while, we might know exactly what's going to happen, and for whatever reason, we make that choice anyway, and we have regret. But so often, our regret is tied as people to our inability to know everything. So how in the world can God regret something if He knows everything? Well, that's a great question. If you're studying the Word, if you're studying the Scriptures, that's a great question to wrestle with. 
How can he regret something? We go back to the time of the flood. God regretted even making humans. Even making creation. And so what did he do? He wiped it away. So he could renew it. God's regret, though, is not tied to lack of knowledge because God does know everything. He knew this was going to happen. He knew this was going to come. We know this specifically in Saul's case because we know, as Samuel said just a few chapters ago, God's already got got another guy. He's already got a man after his own heart. We know that man is going to be David. We'll get there in the fall, Lord willing. We know that. God knew what was going on. He's already working ahead. In fact, He was already working ahead to the cross at this point. He already knew that Jesus would have to come, that no king would be the one until He sent the King of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and to rise from the grave. God knew this. So all of these exercises, you say, well, why didn't you just get to the point? Because this was the point. But He still says, I regret that I made Saul king. Does that mean that God is stepping back and going, whoa, I blew that choice. I really messed that up. No. I believe with all my heart, this is, and, and looking consistently with Scripture, what God is doing is trying to convey the broken heart of a holy God to a sinful man and a sinful people like Samuel and the Israelites. How do you explain that? He could have opened it all up and revealed all of himself to them and then they would have just gone away because they couldn't have handled it. Much like they couldn't see the face of God because they could not handle seeing him face to face in his holiness. If he had just explained everything, well, that would have been tough. That would have been different. So he does what only a loving Heavenly Father can do. He puts it in a way that his people can understand what they need to understand. To Samuel, whose job it was to now go and confront Saul and say, Saul, you you didn't do what you were supposed to do, and here's what's coming next. Regret was the right emotion to communicate. Did God make a mistake? No. Whose mistakes were they? Saul and the people, right? It wasn't God's mistake. He didn't regret it because he didn't know what was going to happen. He regretted it because his heart was broken. He is grieved. Our disobedience, just like Saul's, grieves the heart of God, breaks God's heart. The thing about God is, is even in his broken heartedness, he still doesn't even have a shadow of sin in him. He still is him. He knows it's coming, but he loves us in such a way that he wants us to do and wants us to obey as he says so that we can know Him the way He's offered us to be able to know Him. Saul had that chance as the king of Israel, but he didn't do it. And that's why God said He regretted He made him king. He said, because He's turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. He goes on and Samuel tells us that he was, Samuel himself was angry. and He cried out to the Lord all that night. Our disobedience breaks God's heart, but it also breaks the heart of the godly people in our lives. This morning, you may be out there and not think that your sin bothers anybody but you. Not think that you not doing what the Lord has called you to do and what you know that the Lord has called you to do, whatever that may be. You may think that that's your choice and it's personal and nobody else should worry about it. But your God is brokenhearted by your disobedience. And the godly people who He's placed around you to love you and to point you back to Him, it breaks their heart too. Do they stop loving you? Does He stop loving you? Absolutely not. But do consequences come as He brings them? Absolutely. Our disobedience breaks God's heart. So what did Samuel do? In verse 12 it says, early in the morning he got up and he went to meet Saul, but he was told that Saul had gone ahead to Carmel. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, why had he gone there? Well, he went there because he, in further disobedience, in more selfishness and big-headedness, in more lack of humility, has erected a monument to God? No. It says in verse 12, middle of the verse, it says there he set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone down to Gilgal where he's lauded, where he's he's thought well of in many ways. It says when Samuel reached him, Saul said, (laughs) Hey, good to see you. Preacher, so glad to tell you what I've done for God. 
Man of God, let me tell you, I follow God's instructions. Is that true? No. <laughs> In fact, he's blatantly and deliberately not followed God's instructions. But that's what he thinks he's done. Because he's so blind to what he's doing and what his motivations are. He's so blind to all of that that he doesn't even know at this point. He doesn't even comprehend what God's really doing. He thinks he's trying to be the best king he can be. And in that way, if that's what God wants. He's doing what he said he was supposed to do. Or what he thought he was supposed to do. His disobedience in breaking God's heart is going to go further. He's confused about it. We get that way too, don't we? We get that way. We get confused and we think, oh, I'm doing just what God's called me to do. But if we ever look back at what his word says, we find out that there's a huge disconnect sometimes in what we're doing versus what he says we should do. What we're thinking versus what he says we should think versus uh, you know, what we're thinking and our ideology of it all compared to what he tells us is true. He thinks he's doing the right thing. In verse 17, after, after a few more things happen, after, after hearing that, hey, I've done what the, what the Lord says, well, Samuel says to him in the following verses, before we get to verse 17, he says, well, what's this sound of livestock I'm hearing? <laughs> if you've done what the Lord said, why do I hear all, these, all this livestock that's not ours that came from the Amalekites that you were supposed to destroy? And Saul tells him, well, hey, I, I, I kept Agag alive so that you know, we could do with him as we please, and I, and, and I kept the livestock alive so we could make good sacrifices. I kept him alive, so, and, and he actually says specifically to Samuel, so we can sacrifice the best of the best of their animals to your God. Well, that's a loaded statement. That's a loaded statement. Let me tell you, as a Southern Baptist preacher, I hear those statements a lot. I hear them all the time. Preacher, we're going to do this so that we can do that. And this might be uh, you know, questionable, but that is the wrong direction. But people come up being so proud. This is what we're going to do. We're going to get everything right. And we miss the point. We miss the heart of what God had us to do with everything. And we get very specific in things, and we miss it. And a lot of times, we get in the same situation Saul was in there in these verses that we're moving past here this morning. And think that, well, I'm going to do it because that's what everybody else think is, thinks is right. We're going to do it for their God. Saul says to Samuel, no, we, we kept all this plunder. He knows for themselves. But when the man of God is before them, not just some small church preacher or big church preacher for that matter, but because of the presence of God represented in Samuel, he says, oh, no, we wanted to make this holy. And he's just faking it again. He's just saying what he thinks is the right thing. Because he knows he's done wrong. He knows it. And then in verse 17 we pick up and it says, Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy these wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord, your God, at Gilgal. He doubles down. What Saul misses in this and what we often miss is people who oftentimes claim to be Christians who may not actually be. You say, oh, is that any of your business? No. But as a pastor of a church, you know what is my business? The spiritual health and well-being of this congregation. And you can have all kinds of thoughts about that, but every pastor who's ever stood at this stage or the stage of the old church or any other time that you've been under a pastor, that pastor's been called and he will be held accountable for the choices you make. You say, well, why does he get so upset about things? That's why. That's why. Because God holds me to a different standard than he holds you to a higher standard. And I'm okay with that. I'm not mad about that. But if you ever wonder why it matters that we do this a certain way and not another, that's why. It's not because, oh, Rich just wants to do things his way. It's because I'm on the hook for you. Now, I accepted that call. I accepted that call specifically here about almost four and a half years ago. I accepted, accepted that call in my life more generally when I was 16 years old. I'm not running from it. 
But what we do here sometimes as Christians, what we do here sometimes as a church, sounds good. We think it looks good. It may have nothing to do with actually being Christian and helping others to become Christians themselves. A lot of times it just has to do with keeping our little kingdom, keeping things the way they were, or getting them back to the way they were. If God wanted things the way they were, he would have ended it right there. By nature of the fact that we're still a church, he has more for us to do. He has more people for us to reach. He has forgiveness for us to ask for and to give out. He has service for us to enter into that we've never even seen before. Some of it, we might have seen some of it in the past, but some of it's going to be brand new to us. If God still has us as a church, that means there's still work to do. If our job was done, the doors would be closed and nobody would be in here this morning. A lot of times we do a lot of these things just like Saul did. We have different motivations. We miss it. Understand this morning that the Lord is specific. The Lord is specific. God at no point in Scripture says, hey, you know what? Here's my word. Just do your best, and we'll work on it later. Uh Uh-uh. But isn't that how we approach it a lot of times? Oh, well, they mean well. Or, oh, well, well, they most of the time do right. Or, oh, I'm a good person. Don't fool yourself. We might think good of you. You might think good of you. Other people might think good of you. But standing before a holy God, none of us are good by ourselves. It's going to be a surprise for a lot of people come judgment day. But I thought I was a good person. And Jesus is going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Because the Lord is specific. He's first off specific in this. If we've not surrendered our whole heart to Him, if there's not been a time and it's not growing in time over our lives, of of where we wake up each morning and say, God, I'm yours and I want to glorify you. Forgive me of what I've done, even though I've already got forgiveness and salvation. Forgive me of it. Let me know that forgiveness. And God, let me move forward in serving you obediently. If that's not who we are, if that's not true about us, we have no business dictating the things of God. Because if that's not true about us, we're not of God. We're still of this world. Now, again, Preacher, why are you talking about that? Because like, that's the way Scripture talks about it. That's the way God talks about it. He is clear and specific. He says that there are two types of people in the world. It's not good and bad. It's saved and lost. You have the opportunity. Many of us who get the opportunity a lot because we're in these buildings a lot. We're hearing God's Word a lot to respond to His Word with obedience. To hear His specific command for us and reply to Him, Yes, Lord. Here I am, send me. Let me be yours. I give my whole life over to you. I believe in you, and let me show you that I believe in you by what I do. God's specific about those things. He calls us to be able to do that. How often do we get caught up, though, in all the the stuff without the core of it? How often do we try to do the things that He said to do and do our way of thinking about those things but we don't actually see what he's done because he's never changed our hearts. This morning, if you're out there and you're getting mad at me right now because I'm talking about this, he's probably talking to you. If this bothers you when you hear sermons like this, it probably means that God is wanting to reach your heart specifically with the specifics of his grace and his gospel this morning. Y'all, I don't think about all week just how mean I can be up here because it's not fun. I don't enjoy this part of preaching. Samuel didn't enjoy the part where he had to go and tell Saul, hey, yeah, I know you think you follow the instructions, but you haven't, and you're not. Friend, this morning, if you're watching at home, if you're here in our sanctuary, know that God loves you. I love you. But God doesn't look upon our sin and say, well, I love them, and it'll be okay. And neither should we. We should love one another to repentance. We should love one another to faith. We should love one another to growth. And I know I'm far from perfect in that. I'd love to be able to tell you, hey, do it as I'm doing it. Don't, (laughs) because I'm still bumping along and stumbling as much as anybody. But follow the Lord's specific will in that. Samuel tells him in verse 17, he told him, look, you used to think about yourself humbly when God first put you over his nation, over his people. And then now you've started to think about yourself in a more puffed up way. Isn't that true of us at salvation? We think about ourselves in that moment when we give our faith to Jesus. We think about ourselves truly as we are, a sinner in need of a Savior. 
But for a lot of us in the room, that's been a long time ago. And over that time, we started to think more about, well, well, I've done a few things. I've preached some sermons. I've been a deacon. I've been a Sunday school teacher. I've been a this. I've been on that committee or this committee. Uh, people know that I'm part of this church, and they know that I do this. And if we're not careful, we can start to, instead of thinking ourselves small before a big God, we can think of ourselves as big in front of a big God and thinking we're bigger than we should. And then we find ourselves doing exactly what Saul is hearing from Samuel, that he had already heard from God, and it's already happened in verse 18. He said, look, God sent you on a mission. He told you to totally wipe them away. He was very specific with you about what you should do with the Amalekites. And then in verse 19, Samuel asked Saul, why did you not obey the Lord? Saul was under the impression he had because he didn't get the specific nature of God's command. And Samuel points out to him in verse 19, he says, why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? And then he comes back with these excuses again. Oh, we were going we to use them to worship God. We were going to do the right thing. We were going to, you know, we were going to do what would honor God, but they missed what would honor God in honoring themselves first and then trying to honor God later. The Lord is specific. Verse 22 continues on through verse 29, and we read this. It says, But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, He, God, has rejected you, Saul, as king. And then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being that he should change his mind. Harrisville Baptist Church, people that we love dearly, understand this this morning. Let us all understand this together, that God alone is king. There's no king, there's no pastor, there's no chairman, there's no person who stands ahead or even close to even with God. God alone is king. Why is Saul having this problem? Because he didn't get that. He sought himself to be a great king instead of letting God be the king that only God can be. He did this in so many ways, so many things. Just looking quickly over those last few verses, Samuel looks at him and says, look, it's not about the sacrifice. It's about the reason and the person the reason we do sacrifice and the person we sacrifice to. The only reason sacrifices matter is because God has said they matter. And if we don't care about God, then they don't matter because they're just acts. So glad you're here this morning. I'm so glad you may be watching at home. But you know what? In the grand scheme of things, if you're hinging your salvation or your Christianity or even your growth in faith just on whether or not you sit in a pew or watch on a screen, You're not letting God be king. <laughs> and he alone is king. God only cares that you're here because you're here to worship him. And all the things we do here in this church, on these grounds, in these buildings, even in the bodies that we have, if we've put our faith in God, everything we do is to honor him. And it must line up with his command that is specific to honor him. And how to honor him. If we don't care about him first, well then being here, we might as well be somewhere else. Some of us are like, all right, cool, the preacher said I could be somewhere else. Well, if that's how you want to do it, well, good luck. Because you're literally on your own. you got people who love you and will break your heart if you don't keep coming. But the reason they want you to keep coming is not because coming makes you Christian. It's because being exposed to the truth of God's word and the power of his spirit, that he can, he can work on you anywhere. We believe it's more likely that he might work on you if you're in here and paying attention. 
if you're in part of our ministries and serving and doing these things, even if you're not saved yet, he might save you through that. He's king, and he's calling to you, but it's not just about doing the things. He delights in our obedience more than the things that we do that are obedience. Does that make sense this morning? He delights in the fact that we want to obey him. And if we want to obey him, then there is grace when we mess up. But if all we're doing is doing the things so we'll look good in front of everybody else, that's a problem. Samuel says, to obey is better than sacrifice. The heed is better than the fat of rams. Then he takes these two, uh, two, two uh, comparisons here. He says rebellion is like the sin of divination. What's divination? Sin is, uh, the sin of divination was to, to seek someone other than God and how to make a, de- a decision, to find a power outside of God to see what we should do. He says rebellion is that way because we take the, the control out of the king's hand and put it in somebody else's hand, ours or somebody else's, and we rebel against him. He says arrogance is like the evil of idolatry. It's like worshiping someone or something else. What is arrogance? Arrogance is when we start to look at ourselves for power and understanding and the right way to go. He says, because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Saul, at this point, will continue to be king, but God has removed his hand. The favor that God had given him, the times that God would listen to him when he was obedient, those times are through. God has moved on to another This morning, I don't want to stand up here and and twist Scripture around to tell you that, oh, God's going to move on from you. Because I believe that as long as you have breath, God gives you an opportunity to use that breath to proclaim your faith in Him, to confess that He is Lord. So I'm not going to tell you this morning that, hey, look, you had your chance, and now God's just leaving you that way. Because if you're still breathing, if you still comprehend, God can still save you. No one is too far gone. No one is past being able to submit to him as king. But if we've learned anything the last two weeks, we don't know how long we get to breathe. We don't know when our last chance is going to be up. And sometimes we get a diagnosis or we hear about things and we start to reasonably expect that our time might end sooner than we think. But many times we don't have a clue when it's coming. We don't know. And from that standpoint, I would, I would beg you, don't put off letting God be your king. Saul turned around to Samuel and said, I, I beg you, forgive me, I've sinned. Help me make it right. Help me do this and help me, help me honor God. But Samuel says, no, God has spoken. He has passed his judgment upon you in this matter. He is king and it is final. It's done. Saul's time ran out. Another king was already in the, in the midst of having been chosen. It was about to come on the scene. And then in the last picture of what's going on here, Samuel leaves, begins to get up and leave the place. And Saul reaches out and grabs his robe and it tears. And Samuel in the Spirit of the Lord says, just the way this hem of my garment, this hem of my robe just tore, God has torn away the favor from you. Just as it can't be made perfect again, yeah, we could sew it back, but you'd always be able to tell Saul would never be able to be the king that he could have been if he was obedient. For you and me, that should remind us that once it's our time, we don't have any time anymore to make the choice. So if we're putting off the choice, we better hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, don't wait any longer. If we're wondering when or how long we have, well, we won't know but we've got today. We've got today. God alone is king, and it breaks his heart when we disobey him. So what about you this morning? Would you begin to obey him? The first thing, if you want to do that, is to make sure that you've said, God, I'm not doing this on my power. I'm giving my life over to you. You gave your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. I want to die to my old self that I might be yours through faith in Christ. This morning, you can do that. If you've been fighting it, maybe, maybe having some things that you didn't really want to hear, maybe the Lord used that, and I hope and pray He did. I know He's got a purpose for it, or else I've messed up big time. But I believe He does. And this morning, if you, in your heart of hearts, know that you've never put your faith fully in Jesus Christ, don't let another day pass. Nothing else you'll do today will be more important or even anywhere close to as important as that decision that God may be calling some of you to make this morning.
If you're here, you can come in the invitation in just a few moments and we can talk right here or set up a time to talk another place sooner rather than later while we still have today. If you're watching online, let us know. Comment on this video. Send us a text. Send us a Facebook message. Send a smoke signal. Whatever you can do, let us know that you need or want or have been saved because you've given your faith to Jesus. For the rest of us that have, for those of us that know we have been saved this morning, let's stop being disobedient. Let's stop being fooled into thinking we're doing what God says because we're doing churchy type stuff. And let's make sure that what we're doing has at its heart obedience and worship of the one true King. Let's not, be, let, let's not let it be true of us. At Harrisville Baptist Church, you had every opportunity. Let's not have God say that He's taken the opportunities away from us because we did nothing with them. Let's make sure that we as a church, as a group of people who gather together as a body of believers here in these buildings, here together in these ministries, let us say that we are following God in His specific command as faithfully as He will let us. Not that we're just doing the things that we've deemed to be what we think He said. Let's get right to the root and let's worship and honor the King. This morning, if that's you, you need to make some sort of decision, do it right where you sit or come down the aisle and do it. If you need to come and make a decision public, we would love for you to come and share that with us so that we might be able to celebrate with you as a church. Maybe it's to join our church as a member. Maybe it's to follow through with baptism that you've been saved and you've never been baptized. Maybe it's something totally different that we haven't even mentioned, but God is doing in your heart. Come talk to us about it. Maybe it's a prayer concern that you need to come and bow down right here at this altar and, and, and pray to the Lord, not so everybody will see you and go, oh man, poor so-and-so. No, that so that they will pray with you and say whatever it is that they're dealing with, good, bad, terrible, awful, boring, whatever it may be, God, help them. Let your will be worked in their lives. This morning, don't, don't get anchored to that pew and just wait out another song to be sung. Let this be a morning where you can truly say that you saw the king and that the king that you saw was the king of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, God Almighty. Don't get stuck in your own understanding this morning, but lean into him and let him save you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you work serious business in our lives. Our sin is serious. Whether it's serious to us or not, it's serious to you. Lord God, would you forgive us of that sin by letting each of us know for sure that we've put our faith in Jesus Christ, that we've repented of that sin, wanting to turn away from that, committing to give you our lives and salvation. If there's one or more here this morning that have not done that, let today be the day. Lord God, if we have done that, then Lord, let us not live in ways that would contradict our salvation. Let us not live as if we serve other kings or ourselves as king. Let our salvation be lived out more and more each day as we grow to understand it and to do it in obedience to you, our King. Father, whatever business you want to do in our hearts, work now. We give you all the glory for it as we submit our lives openly and fully to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand.
ازش میشه Father in heaven, we thank you for the message that you have given us today. Pray that it would um, be convicting in our hearts and that we can put it into practice uh, in our lives. Pray that you would just bless this offering that we're about to receive and that we can use it for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, our ministry spotlight is just to tell you a couple of things, uh, some important things that are coming up. Uh, one, you can still give towards Annie Armstrong. We're up to $750 of our goal of $1,500. Uh, we know that next week is an important day in the life of everybody. It's Mother's Day, right? Uh, we have, uh, we've, we're excited. We've been working on this for a little while, trying to figure it out. It's also Brotherhood Breakfast Day, but much like uh, any time Mother's Day comes along, guys, we need to shift our plans, don't we? we got to make sure we take care of the ladies in our lives on Mother's Day. They may be our moms, they may be our grandmothers, they may be our aunts, they may be just be special ladies that God's put in our life, and we want to celebrate them as we worship the Lord together next week. So next week, ladies, we're going to have a gift for each and every one of you, so don't miss. Make sure you're here. If you're, unless you're going to uh, you know, celebrate Mother's Day at another church, we'll, we'll give you a pass on that. We hope you'll be celebrating here. We're going to have a special service, kind of like our special, uh, you know, our special times uh, when we do Christmas and Easter and things like that, other types of services. Uh, we're going to have a breakfast for you ladies. It's a ladies' breakfast, but men, we're going to help cook, all right? So the Brotherhood guys and, and the deacons and, uh, and, and any other men who want to take part in that, we're going to cook that. We'll give you some details on that this week uh, if you want to come and pitch in to help. But ladies, it's going to be more than donuts. Donuts are wonderful, and there will be some donuts there, but it's going to be a hot breakfast uh, and we're going to get to come. We didn't want to make you guys get up and be here at 7 a.m. and have to get ready and look as pretty as you do. So we're going to have breakfast at 8.30. We'll start our worship service a little early. Steele's having a heart attack back there because normally when we start early, he has to have extra music ready. We're not going to have any extra music. We will be doing baby dedication, though. So we have a little extended part of our service. Uh, if you'd like to take part with the families that are going to do baby dedication with us, we're going to have that going on. So Next Sunday morning, no Sunday school, 8.30, breakfast, come. It's not a, a, a program in there. If you get there a little after 8.30, moms, if that's what it helps to celebrate your day, come a little late. It's okay. Uh, you got from 8.30 to 9.30, come join us in, in our meal. 
And uh, then at 930, we'll be in here with our worship service. And then when the Lord dismisses us, we'll head on to celebrate the rest of Mother's Day. There won't be any evening services. So looking forward to a great Mother's Day celebration together with this church, with our body of believers here at Harrisville Baptist. And I hope you'll be a part of it. If you're watching at home, we'd love to have you come and be a part of that as well. All right. I've been told Mr. Ken Barlow's got an announcement. And I'm going to meet you guys at the back. Still, you've got it. All right. Uh, last week, I got a call from Trent Grantham. Uh, a lot of you know uh, Brother Kent's retiring over the New Covenant Church and Trent's got it. So anyway, he called on about asking about the ball field. So what it, is, what it amounts to is I'm just going to throw this out there. I've had my, I've paid my dues. Um, but anyway, uh, they're starting a church league, softball. Um, uh, the New Covenant Church is going to be in it and uh, as well as some churches around Florence and maybe Star. I don't know who all, but. Anyway, they're going to have uh, co-ed softball, and they're going to have men's softball, church, church league. And it's going to start uh, in 1st of June. I think it's $400 a team they're going to uh, charge. So if anybody wants to work on getting a co-ed team to play softball in this league, they're going to they're gonna need to know by June the 1st. And uh, that's the deadline to, to get in. So, uh, or if they want to have a men's softball team. So uh, anyway, I just want to throw that out there and – you guys that are in the right age bracket, if you want to <laughs> tackle it, we're in it for. So, all right. All righty. And what a great way to celebrate your mothers is to get their cars nice and clean. So the youth will be having a youth car wash. Ah, see what I did there? Next Saturday morning here in the parking lot from 9 to 1. Donation base, come, and if they do a good job, give them a good donation. If they do a bad job, give them a penny and tell them to do it again. Amen. So it's just 9 to 1 in the parking lot. Just come through. I know there's going to be some stuff going on at the fire department, so on your way to the fire department next Saturday, just come through and get your car washed. Amen? Amen. All right, if y'all would, please stand. I'm so glad.